Wisdom. 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 Reading from the Old Testament, I'll be reading from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. And then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery or a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who was bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was that if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And then from the New Testament, I'll be reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Some of the most wonderful words for many of us in the Bible. Although there's this little part that many people don't realize is also in No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God always blesses the reading and the hearing of this his most holy and precious word. Amen. Did you know that God loves you very much? And God loves you very, very much. This is the theme that the youth were talking about a lot last night. From, from the greatness of, of God's glory and His power in creating everything that is, the, the whole universe and, and the vastness of it, scientists are still trying to figure it out. They keep coming up with new explanations for it, but they can't figure out how it all started. to the most minute cells that are in our bodies. Did you know that the, the smallest cell in the body is in the shape of a cross? Did you know that? It's called laminate. We talked about this last year, I think. It's called laminate. And it's the cell that connects all the other cells. It actually is a protein. And it connects all the cells. It's like a little Velcro. Top, bottom, sides, all the cells connect to it. Laminate. And it's in the shape of a cross. Amazing, this God who created everything that is, and, and, and human beings so uniquely personal that he puts a cross, billions of crosses, inside each of us. And he knows us so very very uniquely, individually. He knows each of us. Isaiah 49, 16 says, Behold, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. I can't come up into the cross when I read that. 
And that's from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. You don't think Jesus is all the way in the Bible? Old Testament and New? Isaiah says, friends can forget you. Right? You ever had a friend forget you? You ever been in junior high school? <laughs> oh, now their memories are coming back. <laughs> friend one day, not a friend the next. Families can even forget each other. The scripture from Isaiah says, even a mother who nurses her child can forget the child. Hard to believe, but it can happen. Families get divided. But God says, friends can forget friends, families can forget family, but I will never forget you because you are engraved on the palm of my hands. When Jesus died, he died for you and for me. And he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he still loves us. You ever do something really wrong? And then, well, we get excuses. And we know they're not the greatest excuses, but we give them. We try to fool ourselves into thinking sometimes maybe that we're better than we are. I was talking about with Tim Piper the other day, he's taking a class on emerging adults, is that it? Or emerging adulthood from like 18 to 29 or 30, those. What, what did you say about that? Can, can you have a microphone? Can you just say, I, I'm putting you on the spot. Can you just say that about the, the lack of guilt that is there? He was telling me this and I, I found this was very interesting and I see it a lot in our culture today. Well, I guess the preface is not to be picking on the generation, because each generation has its baggage and, and so forth, but I think that uh, in each generation, in some ways, is sold a, a bill of goods by the world. Yes. And with this generation, it's called no regrets. No regrets. And with that, it's all the life experiences uh, add up to who they are, and therefore, if you have any regrets about a life experience, you are therefore devaluing yourself. So it's all, it comes back to self, and you're valuing yourself instead of how God sees you. Uh, we're all sinners uh, fallen in, only here by the grace of God, and uh, fallen short. But to have no regrets means that, in essence, uh, there's no sin and there's no wrong. Uh, it's relativism also. And no need for a savior. Yes, that's uh, unfortunately with many of the unchurched. It's one of the most unchurched uh, populations or most unchurched uh, uh, demographic groups ever. Yes. Ever in the history of, uh, of the United States, at least. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that. No regrets, no real guilt, no sin doesn't mean anything to a lot of people. And I don't think it's just that generation. I think it's a lot of us. And my generation too is like, it's all about me, it's all about us. We were the selfish generation. I think the younger generation isn't so selfish. They're willing to do things and you know, they just have their different qualities about the mind was a selfish generation. It's all about me, you know. Well, that gets in the way of God too. We all need to understand that we are human and that we are sinful and that we all need forgiven and that we need a savior. And Jesus Christ is that Savior. In spite of all the wrongs that we do, in spite of all the, the wrong thinking that we have, God still reaches out to each and every one of us and says, I love you so, won't you come home to me? 
won't you come home? I'm so thankful to be a Christian. I'm so glad to know that Jesus Christ is my Savior and that he forgives me. Because when I look in the mirror and when I get real with myself, I know that I do sin. I make mistakes. I put myself first and God second many times. That's a sin. Anything that keeps us from God, that separates us from Him, and we all do things, and we all need His saving grace. And, and, and when we receive that salvation, when we receive that grace and that forgiveness, and we really receive it, not just say, okay, I did it, but when we go, oh my goodness, my sins have been taken away. They've been washed away, and, and if you ask God about them, they'll say, they're not, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about them. They're gone. Just like erased from a whiteboard. Just gone. The prophet says, our sins are thrown away as far as east is from west, which is infinity. They are no more. So I thank God for his wonderful love and the saving grace and for reaching out to us. This, this obscure scripture from the book of Numbers about snakes is so interesting. The people sinned against God and against Moses. They, they rebelled against him and they said, we're tired of this yucky bread you keep giving us every morning. It was called manna. It was God's bread. Bread from heaven. They said, we're tired of it. Tastes the same every day. But if not for that, they'd have nothing to eat. They were ungrateful. And so the Lord said, I've had enough of it. And he sent these snakes. And they start biting the people. And then they go, oh no, we didn't mean it. Help us, save us, Lord. We believe in you. So Moses prays and God says, make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and lift it up. And everybody who looks at it will be saved and they won't die. They will escape death. They look up to that. If that was the only mention of that in the scriptures, none of us would know anything about it. But it's not the only mention. It comes again in the Gospels. In the Gospel of John, just before the most wonderful scripture of all, John 3.16. It's the verse right before. Just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all who believe in Him will be saved. Wow. Jesus says, just as the people were saved from death by looking up to that serpent on the pole, so will everyone for all time be saved if they look up to me on the cross. And if they come to the cross, they will be saved from sin, from death, from ourselves, from everything that keeps us from God.